Hello, so I'm back with uh, Richard Buxton here then, um, a freelance journalist from, from Liverpool, been covering Everton since about 2009. Um, in the previous video, Richard, we spoke about the transfer window, Fahad Mashiri, the payoff to Martinez, etc. But in this one, let's talk about Sunderland on, on Monday night, because we've had to wait a little bit, little bit of a while for this one with the international break. Um, obviously, David Moyes is up at Sunderland, so let's start with him. Uh, a, Play, a, a player, a manager that's obviously been been linked heavily with Everton in the past, has got a bit of history of Everton, managed us for over a decade. Um, what are your thoughts on his appointment at Sunderland, and uh, do you think he'll do all right up there? Well, it's an interesting appointment, I think. I mean, York at Sunderland has been a club. I mean, they run for to lose Sam Allardyce. I think York, the job he did there, um, he's probably one of the best appointments in recent years. I think Moyes, though, is, is probably a, in a similar vein. I think he is a specialist in keeping clubs stabilised and and keeping them up. I mean, York when he took over Everton, then you won't be talking about uh, 14 years ago. Um, you know, it was looking like another prop, potentially third grade escape, and then he managed to stabilise things. And then over time, had the club climbing the table. And then I think the biggest regret was probably he didn't get them into the Champions League. And that was, you know, that final season, everyone was geared towards he had the right players. Um, obviously, injuries hit at the, the wrong time. Certain results could have gone better for him, notably the Anfield Derby. Um, so I think in terms of a club like Sunderland, for where they are now, and you know they're in a different place where Everton are, and I think they're probably where Everton were in 2002. I think he's a good appointment, but he's under no illusions that it's going to be a dogfight. He knows how big football is up there, and also how how against them the odds are stacked. I think. I mean, York at the players he's tried to bring, and he's tried to get the band back together really a bit. I mean, York he's got an Achebe, Pina, um, he made moves for John Ruddy and um, Stephen Naismith from the window that never came off. I wouldn't be surprised if Hibbert and Osman end up uh, taking up free, free transfers there in the next few months just to, to help out lighten the load a bit. Um, but they have got good players there. I mean, you look at Lamine Coney, who Everton were after, and just it never materialised. He, he looks like a good player. Um, they've obviously got goals in Jermaine Defoe. There's a, they have got options there, and I think if, if Moyes can get him playing his type of football, you know, very basketball, very um, rigidly structured, and very tough to beat, I think they might have a fine chance, but... If he, even he's saying we're going to be in a relegation dog fight, then it doesn't really bode well because Moyes isn't one to um, to delude himself or to delude those around him in terms of realistic ambitions. Do you not think he does that though? I mean, he used to do that at Everton where he would still talk about uh, getting enough points so we could stay up after we've been finishing the top half for a while. Do you know what I mean? He kind of is there, is there not an argument with Moyes that he sets, sets expectations a little bit lower so then when he jumps above them? Makes him look a little bit better. Is that fair or not? There's, there's a degree of that. I mean, I'm quite a, quite a much fan, to be honest, in terms of what he did at Everton and in terms of how he is as a manager. Obviously, he's had two very unfortunate spells, both at Old Trafford and abroad, that haven't really worked out for him. But, I mean, I, I don't know if it's a case of... Um, I don't think it's a case of him lowering expectations so he can he can surpass them. I think when, when he does surpass them, I think he lets everyone know about it. But I think... You know, look, the reason why Everton never really scaled the heights that you know a lot of fans hoped and you know probably would have expected towards the end of his tenure is because he doesn't really allow them to. He kind of you know that his mentality remains, and he's it's it's probably been there since he was in charge of Preston. You know, it, it it was definitely there at United that sort of that sort of pessimism, that defeatism, that you know we're the underdogs. I mean, I remember when they, when. It was built to the 2012 Epic Cup semi final. We all went to Finch Farm, and Moyes, we thought, would be, thought it'd be British with confidence here. You know, Everton are, are above Liverpool in the league. They're a better team than Liverpool in the league at the moment. I mean, Liverpool were on a bit of a slide, you know, with the Daglish mm. uh, in the league domestically. Uh, and Moyes, his first thing is, we're still the underdogs, and you're thinking, the, the shift's changed. You finished above Liverpool last season. You're probably going to finish above them this season, barring, you know, a massive capitulation. So, this whole thing about we're the underdog when you finished above them. One season already, and potentially, you know, in in succession, it it just smacked of, of being a bit too, bit too myopic and a bit too negative. And I I, do, I wonder if, if that's just Moyes' mentality because he's well, that, uh, yeah, that that's sorry, right. that's that's kind of what I'm talking about. I mean, I, I recall that as well, and it's that let's suppress any expectations. So then, potentially, you know, if Everton would have gone on to win that game, which they very well could have, I remember Jalovic put yeah. us uh, ahead before half time. Uh, then it would have maybe he could have come, come out and said, "Oh look, we're, we're the underdogs again today." I said we were the underdogs and we've managed to beat Liverpool. Do you know? Do you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. I think, I think that's. But I think the problem is though, that that mentality it works against him because you're. I mean, Everton should have been probably even with 
you know, the traditional big four, you know, the United City, Chelsea, your Arsenal, Liverpool, and then, you know, as time progressed, Man City in Liverpool's place, and even Tottenham, you'd say Everton should still have been up there, you know, pushing for what what became Europa League places. You know, obviously they had the, the run in the way for Cup in 2008, but it were never really, and obviously the season after, but you never really saw them making, you know, you look at when, um, when Martinez took them to the, I think it was the knock-up stages and the, the, the Kiev defeat. So that's your sense of actually, you know, before that, the, the return, like you thought, Evan could go all the way here. Evan could actually win this. You know, there's potential for this. To, you could probably have an all major side final, the way it was shaping up. Um, and then when Liverpool got knocked out, you thought, well, Evan could probably go on and win this in their own right. You know, they don't need to, to hang on Liverpool's coat, so they can probably do this. And then they went over to where Kevin, it all unravels. So I just feel like, but that was never a moment that we thought, I mean, possibly the 2009 Cup final, you probably thought, here's the moment here. But there wasn't really anything after that. It was all, you know, it was all pretty much, well, let's get the 40 points and then that's it. You know, we get a win over Liverpool, the season's been a bonus. There was never really any genuine inclination to kind of push harder. I just think his mentality was, well, you know, we weren't expected to do well, so if we get knocked out by Chelsea or we get knocked out by, um, as it turned out to be Wigan, we've done all right because no one expected us to get to the quarterfinals. And, you know, you look, Wigan won that heavy cup that season. Mm. They will, I mean, Evan would have walked that. If Evan had put, put him over a fight, you know, put Tim Howard into the young mucker, there might have been a different story. You know, not played Phil Neville and Sylvan this time in defence. There might have been, well, Phil Neville in midfield, rather, but there might have been more of a fighting chance. There might have, you know, I think Evan probably would have been in that epic up final against City. And I think given Moyes' record against City, he probably yeah. would have been. But, you know, it's all about what is from Moyes. I think it's all, you know, if he'd done this differently, if he'd done that differently, you know, he recruits well. He does. He, he works miracles with what he's got and what he's inherited, I think. But I don't think he ever really. He's never going to be a top manager. I don't think he'll ever be. Um, I don't think he'll ever get a job at United again. I don't think he'll ever be a, a club like United. Or I mean, you know, Sochidad could have been a springboard or something. But again, he just he had better players, I think, at Sochidad than he's got at Sunderland. I just don't think he knows how to. He's not really what you call a high end coach in that respect. I think he's more no. a survival specialist, and that's why. You know, I think he does well with it, but I think being a survival specialist means he does the whole 40 points thing. Yeah, it's interesting on the the front of uh, when Saturday comes, uh, the magazine, the football magazine in there. I was at the train station the other day and they had a, they had a bit of a, a piss take on the front. They said that top top European managers uh, come to, to England and they had uh, Guardiola, um, was it Kante, and, and then Moise as a laugh. So uh, that that, <laughs> that, that well, that's, that's true though, isn't it? That's, it, that's the perception of Moyes. It's always been he's always been a manager who's been a he's been a, oh, it's like Sam essentially. He's, he's yeah. a survival specialist, except Sam somehow managed to get to England. You know what I mean? The only way I can see Moyes actually going up from it from the sort of survival special will be to, to kind of you know manage internationally, maybe with Scotland, maybe when Strachan retires or you know going further afield. But I just can't see him being an elite manager. You know, I think the United gig kind of showed him for what he was. Even with you know the player potentially rail against him in the wake of Ferguson's departure, mm. he's not really a manager who I think is at the high standard. I mean, there were people saying when um, when he left Everton, before he left Everton, they saying you know why didn't he go to someone like Liverpool or Chelsea? I don't think he would have lasted five minutes at Chelsea. I think Liverpool we would have been absolutely savage, obviously being an ex Everton manager. Oh yeah, that that couldn't. That happen. I mean, it would never have happened. You know, it, it, yeah. it was kind in the sky. But the Chelsea thing, you know, when it was talking about Luis for Chelsea, I just thought. There's no way he he lost five seconds. Well, he couldn't take that. He couldn't take that um, underdog type mentality to United, and that was potentially part of the problem there. He couldn't go and sit in a press conference before a Champions League game and say at Man United, "Oh, you know what? We're underdogs." So uh, you know what what'll be will be. I mean, you just don't get away with that at Man United. So that maybe was part of the issue. But in your opinion, what what's Moyes' legacy at Everton? What did he do? to um, the psychology of the club was was a lot of it I mean you know there was good bits and bad bits but in, in your opinion how would you kind of summarise and define that um, I think I think Moyes gave Everton its prime I mean you look at the, the, the drudgery of Walter Smith I mean that you know we, we were walking possibly potentially another Mike Walker mark too there and that was that was terrifying um, so I think what Moyes did I think he, he, he restored stability to Everton and then he, he actually restored a bit of ambition obviously he's not and I'm, I wouldn't say he's type, he'll come up with fr- phrases of, well, I can't finish first, I want to finish second, I can't finish second, I'll finish third. And he's just that, that sort of thing, that descending mentality of, you know, 
or we can't we can't finish top, we'll finish next to it, or we can't finish that, we'll go lower down. But he always, I think the fact that Everton would talk about a potential Champions League candidate in his final season, I think that was that was indicative of how Everton had moved as a club. And I think you look at what Martin has inherited from him, the defensive structure mainly, and you know some of the players he inherited, you know, some of the signings were absolutely brilliant. I think mean, PR was inspired. First time out, second time round. Um, Stephen Naismith, I think he was a very useful asset. Uh, Kevin Morales, people forget about, you know, he was actually aligned to the Moyes regime a lot. Everyone kind of sees him as the player who, you know, was thrown out on his ear by Martinez, but he was actually, you know, a very good performer for Moyes. Just, I remember the um, the Aston Villa game, which was one of his first in, and it was him, Pienaar and Jelovic who were all just absolutely brilliant that day. Um, he's, he had good and bad buys, obviously, you know, but who doesn't? But, you know, look at Tim Howard. He had 10 years, through the good and the bad, 10 years out of the goalkeeper, was pretty good at one club. Um, Tim Kale, Mick Arteta. Kale was brilliant. Arteta obviously was, was a sore point. I mean, I'd even say to players he, he, got, he, he recruited through the youth ranks. I mean, Anna Team wasn't a bad player. No, no. Anna Team, I, I thought, I mean, you know, we used to laugh because we used to call him Baby Drogba, so, which we thought was a little bit far fetched, but he was a good player, Anna Team. Uh, Fellaini, great player. I mean, yeah. I think you see him. You see him now when you get a, a player like Fellaini and you play to his strengths, you see what he's like at United now. You saw him in his final year at Everton. Absolutely unplayable. Um, you know, a lot of players, I mean, you know, there's a fair bit of manager you're going to have a billion at the left and all, or you're going to have, in the case of uh, Martin as an Eas or a McGeady, you always have bad buy. Money's in the main board. Well, I mean, you look at Coleman, 60,000, absolutely brilliant. Baines, you know, even, even though he, he took through the nets, and Jack Elkin as well. Both players came through the ranks and then went on elsewhere. Bringing them back, I think, was, was inspired. This time, you know, he got some good mileage out of him. Um, you know, you could, there's so many players you go through that team and say he did really well. I even think, and I know he's probably on the way a bit still, and you know, he's he's nowhere near what he was when he came. Dan Gibson, I think, was actually a really good sign. You look at when he came in, um, I thought he was absolutely brilliant. But you look at the offset to that was every time he got injured, Evertonians just went into panic mode. It was like, well, he's injured, our season's over, any momentum was killed. Um, you know, and that was the sort of the mentality that. That was 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 prevalent at Everton was that they had good players they did the job but if one of them got injured you'd have it so but again that comes down to resources you know Everton weren't exactly you know I think the, I think fans are now saying that that the clubs cash pretty well you wouldn't look at it from the from the market this summer but you know they've got the the, the resources to do so if they need to you know because obviously we're going into Goodison we're going into a new ground you know, there's a lot of things that have changed since since Moyes was there so I think Moyes. For the circumstances he inherited, the, the ones he had to work with, he worked incredibly well. So I think his legacy, and especially compared to Martinez, I mean, we all derided his legacy when um, Everton went to Old Trafford. I know I was quite vocal, and you know, in hindsight, it was a bit foolish given that there was no longevity in what happened with Martinez. But you know, I think his legacy is probably better for what happened with Martinez. I think it actually showed how good of an operator Moyes was, how good of an organiser he was, and you know, I mean. It doesn't take much to get fans on your back, but you know, Moyes managed to stave them off a lot. Martin just seems to kind of been cared and invite them almost the way he played his football. It was too open, it was too um too friendly and it was kind of playing nice. Moyes had a bit of an, an ugly side, I mean, whether he liked it or not. I think Phil Haney put a bit of a bit of that ugliness in, you know, with the elbows and the headbutts and things like that from time to time. But you know, you need to you need to have players who can do that, you need to have players you can win you can win ugly sometimes. And that's yeah. why I like, I like what, what's happened with Gay. He's a player who gets stuck in. You know, he will put his foot in fairly, obviously, but, you know, players who are willing to get stuck in. I think Martin, it was, it was all an old tippy tap into Team Nicey Nicey, but I think that reflected the way football had gone before. Spain do it, so that, that will work for us. And you can't do it in the Premier League. There's too many rough and tumble type of clubs. I mean, you were stoked before Mark Hughes came in. Um, Palace under Pulis, I think, mean, you know. There's a lot of them who who, who play like that. So that's you can't do that. Now. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, they could be another one. That's um, I mean, if he walks away, which is just being talked about at the moment, they could be another one who are who are, you know having to adapt to a new a new style and, and, and get out of that mindset. But that's why I don't think the Martinez way worked, and I think Moyes got wise to it. You know, we. I mean, I think given that Moyes had probably less experience at the top flight, you know, he'd, he'd been a press and come straight to Everton and had to do a massive clear up. Martinez, I, I can't blame you. Had the Premier League experience. He had um, the um, he had a, a very good squad, I've got to say, and a very good defensive foundation. And um, he just decimated it. So I think time showed Moyes. Is, I think the Moyes era was probably a bit of a golden age, really, in comparison to to what we've seen over the past few months. 
and yeah, and, and obviously before that as well. So um, let's uh, let's uh, let's move just away from Moise and, and talk about the game specifically then for a second, and, and move on to Everton. Um, we've got about fifteen minutes left. You want to tell us, uh, James, how you think uh, Everton will line up? Anything that we should potentially look out for? And uh, one thing that I want to pick your brains on and find out is: um, Do you think that Mason Holgate will keep his place now that Seamus Coleman played for Ireland in the week? Well, Koeman's been quite quite forthright on that. He said if, he, if he's fit to play for Ireland, he's fit to play for Everton. But I think there's a danger of going down the route that Martin has went with Tim Howard last season where he picked players on past form and favouritism. I mean, you look how many how many times were people clamouring for Rob West to be given a, a go when Howard was dropping clangers. You know, he had some absolute stickers. The starfish shades were obviously a firm favourite of the Gladys Street, as we know. Um, and yet... Whenever he was fit, he was straight in. I think it was the uh, the Chelsea game, the Stamford Bridge, where everyone was expecting Robles to, to be kept on, and he put Howard straight in. So that, there's a danger of that happening again with Coleman. I think, I think Coleman, he's going to take time to to, to readapt, isn't he? Um, I on form, I'd give Holgate an extended run. I'd say until he, he starts making mistakes and starts, you know, like persistent mistakes, you know, one or two a game. Isn't going to be enough to say right you dropped because every every player makes mistakes. You know some of the more experienced do it more often. Case in point, Tim Howard. So you know dropping a player who's actually surpassed expectations, who's actually done remarkably well. I mean I was impressed with him um, against West Brom and against Stoke. I just thought he, he looked apart. And you know I think when he, when he signed originally, everyone thought it was going to be um, everyone thought Brendan Galway was going to be the player who came in and exceeded expectations and, and Holgate slotted in. And I think everyone was a bit. Where people who saw him at under twenty one level, under twenty three level, probably fall different. But you know, for, for those of us who aren't familiar watchers of that, of that through various reasons, it was it was a bit of a risk. But it was one that you know, if you if if you're good enough, you're old enough. And I don't think that you should put Coleman in based on the fact that he's had one Everton for the Republic of Ireland. I think you need to build your fitness. And I think Ireland may have Ireland, what Ireland considered to be acceptable for you know a game. Which is going to have no ramifications. Everything are going to see it differently. You know, you've got a league. You're going to have cup games. Um, you know, after Christmas, you're going to have more cup games. So, and then and things are going to step up potentially if there's a, a potential European in place in the offing on the Cuban. Then everything are going to need every player available. So you know, Russian Cuban, but um, Coleman back rather. It's it's a dangerous game. I think I think you've got you've got to put players back in when they're fit. And you know, but Ireland standards of fitness may be different for a one-off international game. So Evan. Who you know every point are valuable, um, and you know they'll be dealing with the fault for weeks to come if they, if they throw them in at the defense. No, and I've been extremely impressed with with Holgate as well. I think he uh, said on a previous video that he's light years ahead of where he should be. And at last last week, uh, sorry, the week before last against Stoke, um, the reason why Arn Altovich had a, a bad game or appeared to have a bad game is because Mason Holgate kept him kept him quiet, and that's not. That's not an easy thing to do. On Altovich is one of Stoke's better players, and when he fancies it, he's very, very good. He's powerful. He's strong. He, he, he you know, he doesn't give you. Uh, you know, he's always giving you something to think about. And Mason Holgate, I thought dealt with him exceptionally well. So yeah, I, I'm with you. I think I would, I would keep him in in the side. Um, and and Coleman's got to wait his chance now and, and earn his place back, in my opinion. But let's uh, just move across then into the uh, to the centre half positions. Uh, you expect Ashley Williams and uh, Phil Jagielka to start centre off. I do, yeah. I think I think you've got to go with your most experienced centre back pairings. I think you look at, you know, how many times a, a De Martin's experiment with Stones and Jagielka, and then, then Jagielka and Phyllis Murray, and then Stones and Phyllis Murray last season. And you need to have some continuity. I think there's very little areas you can get away with with um, chopping and changing, and defence is one of them. I think that's, I mean, I think you look at the signing of Williams, I think it's, it, it shows. Um, Cuban short term approach to management. I think, you know, you look at, I mean, Balassi. Um, okay, you know he was going after so he was going after players in the mid to late twenties. Obviously, with, with an eye to let's try and get people up to speed and get the club up to speed. And I think you've got to go with Williams. I mean, I've been a big fan of Williams for years. You look at his um, his appearance record. I think he's only missed something. He's only missed about a handful of games, hasn't he? About fifteen, twenty, maybe something like that. Yeah, it's, it's like, incredible. Yeah. It's like it's like he's like superhuman. You know, you yeah. won't yeah. no one else actually. I mean, you know, why did no one else actually make a move for him? Like a definitive movement. I don't know. I know back in the day when people were looking at him under Brendan Rodgers, but you know that was kind of a familiarity role rather than a, than you know, a, based on his abilities. Whereas I think if you bring them in based on his abilities, I think Evan have got a real player, you know, someone who could probably 
probably take over the, the leadership battle when Jagielka's not in there. And I think as well, Jagielka as well probably needs to have a bit of the, the responsibility taken off his shoulders because as captain, there's obviously a lot of pressure. But I think more so when you have to organise the defence and you know, you've got someone, obviously, John Stones was an exception to the rule because John Stones was, you know, wise beyond his years, more mature beyond his years. Um, but so like Funes Mori, I think, I think it makes people, the job of Jagielka a bit tougher. So I think having Williams alongside them. Is actually going to be helpful, I think, against um, against a team like Sunderland who are going to be tough. And you know, it wasn't really fond memories of the game last season up there in April. Um, I think you need to have a solid foundation, and I think as well that will help with players like Holgate. You can actually lean on them and say to them, you know, you need to do this, or you know, you can have two players marshalling you, and if they're both in sync, which two, you know, if they're, if they're age, both over thirty. I think it will actually be a very beneficial move. I think people see older defenders, they can, you have to press deeper, you, your line's higher. Um, but I don't think it is. I think I think it's actually beneficial. I think sometimes you have to drop deeper, sometimes you have to press higher. But I think having someone like Williams actually gives you more freedom and more more flexibility. Whereas I think if you had if you had two players like Jagielka, okay, I think you'd struggle. I think you would have to drop deeper and you would have all those problems. But I think with Williams, I think because of because he has this remarkable prowess in the air he has this remarkable fitness record I think he he actually gives you more more to work with again but with with Jagi Oka being a senior player and with Holy as a younger and he gives you that aggression as well and you know talking about Martinez's era and legacy at Everton that's something that I think we lost uh, especially after Sylvan Distan dropped out of the side Although he wasn't the most aggressive player, but but then we just we and I said this is something else that I've repeated myself on is that I think that uh, centre forwards would have played Everton over the last two years and thought you know what it's it's not going to be that hard today or in the sense of no one's going to get in our face and give us a tough time. I think now with Ashley Williams we have a little bit more aggression and a little bit more kind of a little bit something something to fear I think as, as a striker. Uh, playing against Everton now, so um, I, yeah, I've, I've been uh, impressed with, with Williams, obviously, the little bits that I've seen of him so far, and I'm quite excited. Where does he differ, though, in your opinion, to, to Phil Jagielka? I mean, you mentioned um, his aerial ability, whatever, but, but and he has that aggression, but um, I mean, did you, okay, let me rephrase that. Do you, do you think that he would potentially make a better captain? Um, I think if it, if it was, if it was you were appointing a captain, with this current squad when Moyes left, I would have probably played Ashley Williams, but obviously circumstances were different then. You had Jack Yelka, he was the more experienced player to take over for Phil Neville. So I think, yeah, I probably would pick Williams. I think he's got more, I mean, you look at what he does for, for Wales, you look what he did for Swansea, you know, he's always, he's always vocal, he's always marshalling, he's always, and he's always, you know, he's, I don't think he's, he's put many a foot wrong really in, as a defender in his own right. So, I think he, he sets an example and it's one that people want to follow and I think you've got to look at the way Wales played in the Euros and yeah, you can say um, Bale was was the catalyst and you know, how Robson Carney win and others who came in into the fold and you know, got the headline. I think Williams was probably one of the, the, the more unsung he- heroes, I think. I think he's probably a better a better catalyst than probably the ones like Bale because I think Bale is all about him and you know, certain to an extent with other players, but I think with Williams, he's more of a team player. And he's more of you know, he wants to to rally people and to try and get them, you know, you know, come on, lads, let's get into this. Very much, very much a, a captain in every sense. You know, a leader of men. Whereas you know, look at some players around the Premier League who aren't like that. You know, you look at Craig Shaw, look at Stanley Park. You know, Liverpool have got a good team, but do I think Jordan Henderson's a leader? No, no. You know, Vincent Kompany's had a lot of injuries at City. Do I think he's a leader? Probably not where he is at the moment. Um, John Terry's always on the slide. You've got to pass about him there at Chelsea. You know, there's other clubs there. You've got to, I think, for leadership, you've got to be someone who's all-encompassing, who's, you know, who's a permanent presence. Williams was a permanent presence for Wales, permanent presence for Swansea. Um, well, that's the criticism with Jaggy Elka, though, in terms of leadership, is uh, people say he's, he's a little bit quiet. Um, you know, and he's not the kind of captain who'll go and you know get in the ref's face, you know, and and, and let the referee know when he's made a, 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 a the wrong decision. And I know you know people say oh, we don't like to see players doing that too much, but Everton don't seem to have anybody like that. So that was the point I was making. Do you think with Williams now we we we've got a captain without being captain? Yeah, but I think I think that's, that's true of a few players. I think that's true of Gareth Barry as well to a certain degree. I think Gareth Barry will be that sort of type. Who will get in the referee's faces? I mean, it's dangerous tendency to be doing that sort of thing now because obviously they're trying to calm down on that. But you need someone who's going to remonstrate. I just feel like 
when I ever played for Remington Chase about something that's gone against them or a contentious decision, it's been their own voices. It's been someone like Furnace Mori or it's been someone like um like like um, Barry. It's never been, you know, someone leading them. It's not been like when you remember that iconic picture of my United players and it was like the evolution of man, you had Keane, yeah. you had Beckham, you had Giggs, you had <laughs> Buck, all lining up. Yeah. Uh, to speak to to, to with Jeff Winter. It was that sort of you don't have that at Everson. You'd have it at other clubs. I mean I, you know, Chelsea used to do it back while on Mourinho. Liverpool have done it. Um, City have done it. United do it all the time. Loads of clubs have done it, but Everson seems to be, and I think that's because it's been knocked down. So I think the whole thing about being too soft on the market, I think it was, you know, it was this whole being, you know, gentleman in football boots. I just don't think it, it worked. I think sometimes you need an Ashley Street because, you know, you can play nice football, you can play really, you know, scintillating attacking football and get, you know, a, a win against Arsenal at home or, you know, beat Man United at Old Trafford once in a blue moon. But it's not exactly going to work against like Stoke City. I mean, Stoke City had a field day at Goodison back end of last year. Arsenal basically steamrolled them. You know, you can't let a team like that come come to your grounds or you go to their ground and just basically, you know, do the whole thing about, well, we, you know, we don't play that way. We play the nice, simple football. We play clean football. You know, you don't have to be going in studs up for people. You've got to show a little bit of aggression, a bit of nastiness and a bit of, you know, determination to win. I think with Martin, you know, he's more fixated with possession stats than he was actually winning the game. You know, he'd always say, well, you know, well, we had this much possession, we had created this many chances. It just wasn't our day. It doesn't really work that way. Football is all about, you know, the actual facts and figures. How many goals were scored? How many goals were conceded? Yeah, yeah. no. So, so and, and moving moving forward though, um, up the pitch, do you think uh, Yannick Balassi will keep his place? Well, I, I would. I think I think you've got to give him a consistent run of the game because I think you know, Kuma was talking about how he wants him to score more goals. You know, I think it was something like nine in three seasons was just unacceptable, and you know he needs to score more and. The only way you're going to get him to score more is giving him a regular run of games, you know. I mean, same same with other players who, who I think are going to have you know, a vital part to play. I think Gerard Delphay, you know, you look at what the way he was in pre-season, and probably to a lesser extent Kevin Morales in that role, as, you know, striking options are short. You've got to use players who are going to give you give you goals. I think is going to be one of them if he's given the chance, and I think he, he'll obviously give more definition on the wing that's been missing since probably, I'd say, since PNR dropped off. Um, a few years back, since probably about twenty thirteen, um, you know, it, it's options that you haven't had with McGee and people like that playing on there, um, and when Morales has been, you know, struggling under the previous manager, so I think you need a player who can come in and hit the ground running, and then that will then obviously have a knock-on effect for people like Morales who will then raise their game, um, and I think Delphayu does need to be given a bit of an extended run, not as a, as a starting striker, but you know, being brought in like he was against Tottenham, being brought in for for a bit of a run out, so he can. He can get out defences and work out how to unlock them because the um, the role of him as a makeshift strike has been one that Kuhn has been pursuing over the summer and probably will need to pursue quite a bit. God forbid if something happens to Romelu Lukaku, obviously Anna Valencia is still there, but again, if Valencia tires in Lukaku's absence or is out of the sort, like we saw with Nias for Nias, yeah. It's Nias Kone then after that. If, if Lukaku does get injured, then as you say, then the only other option then is... And that was why, obviously, Valencia was brought in. I mean, obviously, we all raised our eyebrows a little bit, but um, I think giving him a chance at Everton to kind of reignite his career a little bit, because obviously it's gone stale at West Ham, um, that, that can only be a, a benefit to us. Uh, just on Lukaku then, um, obviously, he got two goals in the week, uh, I think, for Belgium. So hopefully, uh, we'll see him find the net again. But if you were to make a prediction, Richard, um, uh, now ahead of the game on Monday, what would what would you say? How do, how do you think it'll go score-wise? Probably, if it depends on the on the on the fullback position, I'd probably say if it's going to be Holgate. I'd probably say two one three one. Um, Come probably scores also probably one or two or I can't see. I just think bringing Coleman back straight into it might be a bit of a. I think he's more of a last twenty five thirty to bring him to phase him into it, and then maybe after one or two of them, then bring him in, or you have to you know give him a half an hour out in if. If um, Holgate struggles a little bit in, at the Stadium White, and then after the next game, put him in against um, against I forget who it is. Is it? What after some? Bore, 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 sorry. Yeah, yeah. It's too early. It's no, too early. Uh, no. <laughs> um, um, yeah. So, so, so. Yeah, I'd, I'd, I'd give I'd give probably Holgate a start on Berth, and then introduce Coleman if it does look like he's, he's struggling a little bit or he's tiring a bit, and see how Coleman fares then, and then um, after that, then. I think the manager needs to look at whether he's going to pick because I think Borough are going to be tough. So on those grounds, I'd say see how Colm fares in the second half, 
and then if he, if he holds his own and you know he walks, there's, there's no signs of of rustiness or he's still you know he's not struggling with the, the intensity of the game because it will be a tough game and it will be a fast paced game I think I think Moyes will try and try and hit Everton quite hard so obviously former club point to prove um, and Sunderland are, I've got the players you can do that I think he'll I think if he can handle that intensity I'd consider possibly making the transition for the butter in the next week yeah I, I, I don't know if you, you heard me properly there Richard but I was, I was asking what, what you thought the uh, the score would be um, what's your score prediction Um well, I think I said it before but I think it was a uh, I think probably narrow score, and if if he starts with Holgate, if he starts with Cole, I think it'd be a score. Oh, so sorry, sorry, mate. So, so you're putting you're putting a lot. The score line you're saying will depend, yeah, depend on whether he plays on. Yeah, right, sorry, I'm with you, mate. I didn't know whether it was the Skype, and I thought oh, I've already asked you about Mason Holgate. I thought I, it is early. You're right. I thought I was losing my mind as well. Um, no, so you're saying it, it's dependent on on on, on who the plays. Bats, yeah. Right. Yeah, okay. I think it'll be now. It'll be close if if it is. If it's one way or another, it'll be close either way. But I think I think Holgate starting and maybe fading Coleman into it might actually be the difference. Okay, so what are you? So you saying three one then? I'd say two one three one with with Holgate with Alisson probably scored draw so one or two all. Right. Okay. Cool. All right. Well, that's uh, that's uh, that's good to know. We'll keep an eye on that, and we're also on 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 Grand Old Team's Facebook page as well. We'll be putting out um, a, a little score prediction thing for the people on there uh, to guess the score and also uh, those who guess correctly will win a little prize courtesy of Grand Old Team. So, um, Richard, I appreciate you coming on. I've been very insightful, mate. Uh, we'll have to do this again sometime. Obviously, we've, we've done an hour's worth in total, uh, split over two videos, so really appreciate it. Thanks for joining us. No problem. And we'll catch you again soon then on Grand Old Team TV. Yes.